Good evening. And uh, I hope that this does not take too long. I would begin by saying that it was my privilege just about 20 years ago to have met a man who, in my opinion, knew as much or more than any other given individual in this field of alcoholism. His name was Walter Green. He was a medical doctor and a recovered alcoholic. The little doc, as he was very fondly called by everyone who knew him, had lost everything through his own drinking. Beginning with his license to practice medicine, he lost that and from there he went down and he wound up on Michigan Avenue in Detroit, Michigan, bumming nickels for drink. And I can hear him say now that very often, even though the people didn't recognize him, he put his hand out to former patients that he had treated when he was a young intern at Detroit Receiving Hospital, not very far from there. Well. The little doc had a beautiful expression. He says, you don't get AA, it gets you. Well, it got him, and he got well. And he went back to the top of his profession. And he became the medical head of the hospital in Brighton, Michigan. And he had developed a series of talks on alcoholism, which he gave to his patients there. Now. Dr. Green dedicated his entire life from that, from his own recovery on, he dedicated his entire life only to alcoholic men and women. And he treated approximately 6,000 of them before he himself died of cancer some years ago. I would submit for your consideration that this little man knew what he was talking about. He had the experiential knowledge of having been there himself, and he had the, the knowledge mixed with a lot of love of his patients that he had collected over the years. He, he used to say this, a lie can be wiped out with truth. Ultimately, you can explode a lie or a myth or a fallacy with truth. One thing is much more dangerous than any lie ever could be, and that's the half-truth. And there's no field on earth in which there are more half-truths than this one of alcoholism. So he used to say, what can be known should be known. Because if we don't work with solid truth and solid knowledge, death is the result. Alcoholism is a terminal illness. If an alcoholic does not stop drinking, the drinking will ultimately stop him. So Doc used to say in that magnificent simplicity of his, it's rather nice to know what you're sick with so you know what it is you're getting well from. And then he used to try to explain alcoholism, at least the facts that we do know about it, what it is and what it does based on the knowledge of alcohol, what it is and what it does. Alcoholism is one of the oldest illnesses known to mankind. It's been around a long, long time. It's mentioned in scripture, mentioned in a whole lot of other ancient writings. It is, in my opinion, the most complex. We don't even know what causes it. And I can hear Doc saying this as if he just said it five minutes ago, the causes and cures for cancer will be long forgotten even before we come to a knowledge of the causes of alcoholism. We do know the causes of drinking. You can find out why people start drinking, but those things are not the causes of compulsive drinking. Here's where many professionals make a mistake. They conclude that what causes drinking is causative of alcoholism, or compulsive drinking it isn't so at all. It's the most complete illness known. It affects body, mind, emotion, and soul. In other words, when you catch this disease, you get sick all over. And it's the one about which we know the least. Uh, I heard a man as recently as last night say that in the beginning of his own recovery, he figured he knew everything about alcoholism. And now, after quite a few years of recovery, 20-some, he said, I think I'm beginning to learn a few things about it. And so it is a very baffling thing. But to get back to basics, 
the facts about alcoholism, what can be known, should be known, because the results of a half-truth are always tragic. One of the first myths that Doc used to try to explode is a popular belief that practically everybody holds on to. If we can send the alcoholic to some professional who can tell him why he drinks, he won't have a drinking problem. I would like to bet that many of you in this room, uh, when your problem was discovered and when it was acknowledged that there was some trouble with drinking here, were sent to psychiatrists and spent a lot of money and a lot of hours trying to find out why you drank. And if a man or woman is smart enough, they can get to the basic reasons of why you started to drink. But that doesn't dissipate the problem. Has any of you in this room ever gone to a dentist and said, Quick doctor, tell me why my tooth hurts? And after he explains why all the ins and outs of molecular structure of cells and saliva and uh, food and uh, decay and all of that sort of thing, supposing he explains exactly why you have a toothache, have any of you ever said thank you, doctor, and walked out? A knowledge of causes does not dissipate the problem. It doesn't dissipate the problem at all. Proper therapy does. You may know why you have appendicitis, but that's not going to take care of it. Surgery will. You may know why you broke your leg. You weren't careful skiing. But a knowledge of why you broke your leg is not going to heal it. Proper therapy is the answer to any problem. However, Doc says just to clear the air, there are reasons why people drink alcohol. But he said there are reasons why people drink everything. So let's go into the things we drink and why we drink them. The very first thing that crosses human lips is water. Why do we drink it? We have to. We have to. What I, I think they say you can only go so many days without water and you'll die. Most of the human body is composed of water. It has to be replenished and so on. So basically water flakes first. We drink it because it is necessary that we drink it. The next thing we are given is milk. And milk is drunk because we have to drink it. It is so essential to life for some animal species, the human animal included. This is what biologists call us. They call us milk drinkers. The technical name is mammal. That's from the Latin word mama, which means breast, the source of milk. Mammals are milk drinkers, and we drink milk, milk for the sustenance of health. It sustains health to such a degree it's been called nature's perfect food. All right, these two beverages here, water and milk, since they are absolutely essential to human life, they're called natural. These are the natural beverages. But we humans, unlike a whole lot of other animals, drink a lot of other beverages for different reasons. One of the very first things we drink after water and milk is something sweet. Soft drink, soda, hot chocolate, anything sweet. And the reason is so simple. In the very young, among the taste buds, there is a definite preference for sweetness. And so usually our parents give us something sweet when we're very young. The reason? It is pleasing. It pleases taste. We drink it because it tastes good. There's no deep, probing, psychological reason for that. Even though they try to dazzle us with technical language, it is drunk for oral gratification. All that means is that it tastes good. And that is why we drink it. As Doc Green used to say, we please a desire, we do not fulfill a need. We please a desire. And I think this is a, probably the basic reason for drug usage. It pleases a desire. It makes one feel good, but there's no need for that. It isn't necessary. All right. The next thing we're introduced to, especially here in the Western world, is coffee. Now please watch the difference between drinking coffee and drinking these other three things up here, water, milk, and soda. The drinking of coffee has to be learned. You have to acquire a taste for coffee. 
And the reason you have to learn to drink coffee, it is not necessary and it does not taste good. Why in the name of heavens do we drink it? The very first reason explains why we do practically everything. Curiosity. Curiosity. Coffee is a big people drink. They drink it and don't give us any. And when we get old enough to ask, we're told we can't have it because it's not good for us, so we want some. And when we beg enough and enough and enough, somewhere along the line, the mother or the father will take a little bit of coffee, cut it with milk or cream, put a little sugar in it, sweeten it. And some people, when they really acquire a taste for coffee, actually believe that sugar ruins the taste. It ruins the taste. Sugar is put into the coffee of the young because of their preference for sweetness in order to get them to drink it. So, in other words, we take a sip, we slake our curiosity, we are doing what the big people do. That, by the way, is your first step out of infancy, doing something that big people do. The second reason coffee is drunk is simply because it's customary. The drinking of tea is customary in Ireland, Scotland, and England, and so on. The drinking of coffee is perfectly customary here. In fact, the coffee break is so customary, it's written into some labor management contracts here in the United States. And as Doc Green used to say, an AA meeting without a coffee urn is uh, perhaps a serious break. <laughs> Conviviality. There is a certain social aspect to the drinking of coffee. Why do we have a coffee break? so that people can sit around and have conversation while they're having a cup of coffee. You don't drink coffee usually through the day because you're thirsty, but simply because it is the coffee break, and everyone sits around and has one. All right. Now we come at long last to alcohol, the great mysterious thing. Why do people drink? People drink for a whole lot of reasons, but they're just as simple as all of these. They're just as simple and completely uncomplicated as all the rest. The drinking of alcohol is a learned process just like the drinking of coffee is a learned process. It is not necessary and it doesn't taste good. It comes in beverage form that normally is not acceptable, especially to young palates. We have to acquire a taste for alcoholic beverages. Some people drink it all their lives and never acquire a taste for it, but they drink it anyway which is a little bit perverse for starters. Anyway, why do people drink alcohol? Number one, curiosity. It's a big people drink. Even the law says in some places, it used to be universal in the United States, you couldn't drink it until you were 21. Then it became 18, now it's back to 19 in some places, and so on and so forth. Uh, Well, somewhere along the line, you're going to taste alcoholic beverages. That law is a rather crazy sort of a thing anyway. Have any of you in this room ever heard anybody, or have you ever said yourself, let's say you're 15, 16 years old, and you're at a high school dance, and somebody says, how about a beer? And you say, gee, I'd love to have one, but I can't. It's illegal. I'm 21. It is so silly. No one pays attention. We have all tasted alcoholic beverages before our 21st year. We, we satisfy that curiosity. Somewhere along the line, somebody will take a little whiskey, a little water or ice in it to cut it, a little sugar to sweeten it. I used to say a little garbage to make it pretty. We call that a cocktail. Take a sip, you're doing just what the big people do. And this, too, we associate with adulthood. Your first step out of infancy is a sip of coffee. Your first step into the adult world of the macho human being is drinking booze. And I think that some so-called adults are still children at heart, we, for some reason or other, think that drinking alcohol is somehow the manly, the adult thing to do. A little bit crazy. Custom dictates the use of alcohol. Ladies and gentlemen, alcohol has been associated with hundreds of human traditions and customs. It is customary to drink at weddings. We toast the bride in champagne. And if there are any of you at whose heartstring romance still tugs, <laughs> you know the word honeymoon comes from booze? In the Scandinavian countries, they celebrate weddings for a lunar month of complete moon, 28 days. Now, during that month, that moon, 
they drink a beverage called mead, M-E-A-D, which is an alcoholic beverage made out of honey, if you can imagine that. This month, this moon, is called then the marriage month or the honey moon. Now, if you can imagine drinking that for 28 days, <laughs> maybe you can appreciate the expression, the honeymoon is over at the end of it. <laughs> it is customary to drink at births, deaths, weddings, wakes, celebrations, graduations, anniversaries, feast days, holy days, holidays, Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, we're coming to Christmas. Eggnog is a traditional Christmas thing. Mold wine in England. Uh, I think they had something in uh, Dickens' Christmas Carol about Bob Cratchit having a little bit of wine to share with his family around. Uh, the Tom and Jerry. We have the mint julep around May associated with the Kentucky Derby. I saw that on the cover of an airline magazine, May, a mint julep. Uh, we have the Tom Collins in summer, etc. And the apple wine of Germany, the Oktoberfest, you know, when the wines are brought into being, and so on and so on and so forth. It is customary to drink alcohol associated with highlights of human life, and it has been for centuries. Conviviality, good Lord. Alcohol produces a whole lot more conviviality than, uh, than coffee. In fact, the Jews refer to wine as the gift of God that gladdens the hearts of men. Wine is always associated with joyous occasions. It does produce conviviality, and it produces it in a very physical way, which we'll see in a minute. It does make people kind of happy. Um, it is drunk for escape. Now, here's where the professionals have so dazzled us with that he's drinking to escape. There's nothing wrong with that. You know why I have a sweater on tonight? It's cold out. It is so natural to seek to escape the unpleasant by substituting the pleasant for it. If you're thirsty, you take a drink of water. It's cold, you put on a sweater. It rains, you come in. <laughs> to seek to escape unpleasant things is the most normal, natural thing on earth. My friends, alcohol provides escape from unpleasant things. And many people drink it for that. The anxieties of the day. Men and women for generations have had a pre-dinner cocktail or aperitif as they call it in Europe. It relaxes you for one of the most important events of the day, the evening meal which you eat together, which is a social, convivial type of happening. It is the gift of God that gladdens the hearts of men. And for those who can, who, for those who can take it, alcohol has proven to be a fine escape. Some people escape uh, the tensions of life with a vacation, a day off, jogging, running. It's perfectly normal and ordinary to seek to escape unpleasantness by substituting pleasantness. Sometimes uh, unpleasantness can take the form of husbands, wives, jobs, kids, bosses, anything. And it's a marvelous escape from this thing. Anyway, pain. Pain used to be a major reason why people drink. Have you ever used the expression, boy, he was feeling no pain with? That's been said for centuries. He's feeling no pain. And my friends, there is a biochemical reason for this. Alcohol is a painkiller. It kills pain. It really, really does. But we have infinitely better painkillers than alcohol today, so that's not quite a valid reason for over drinking, especially. Now, I've always said if somebody you work with comes in at 8.30 in the morning drunk and you ask him why and he looks at you and says reseeding gums, that is not a very valid reason for being drunk at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> we simply have better painkillers than alcohol, so that's kind of a... But he's always saying, you know, there's an ad that says give your cold a contact, it'll be a whole lot more pleasant if you give it to old granddad. 
Uh, Euphoria is the sixth and final and most sensible, normal, ordinary reason why everybody drinks beverage alcohol. Ladies and gentlemen, euphoria is a Greek word that means a sense of well-being. People drink alcohol because it makes them feel good. Alcohol does what no other beverage does. It makes you feel good. <laughs> King's ransoms have been spent trying to find... Well, why does he drink? Why does she drink? That is the basic, basic reason. This is why the human being will spend 250 on an exotic cocktail when he could buy a case of root beer for the same price. The reason is so simple. One martini does what all the root beer in the world can't do. makes you feel good. makes you feel good. Now, why do you want to feel good? Now psychiatrists can have their day. But why do people drink, basically and fundamentally, to feel good? And you can couple that with any of these other things. It's a wedding. You could choose to drink ginger ale to toast the bride, and you would be taking part in the ceremony and the tradition. But if you have a couple of smashes of champagne, you not only please the bride, you please yourself. You feel good. What is there about this magic substance that makes you feel good? What is it? Basically, it's a chemical composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. C2H5OH is the chemical formula for the type of alcohol that we drink. Now, this will not degenerate into a chemistry lesson. I don't know any chemistry. I know just about as much as the average layman. We all know that H2O is water. I think we have all come to learn that K9P comes from the south end of a dog. But I believe that that would be the extent of the knowledge that most of us have. Now, the only reason I mention that H2O is we're going to see a little bit about it later. C2H5OH, a carbohydrate. It's a quick source of energy, but it is not a food. Alcohol is not a food. What it's in may be. Beer, for example, comes from grain. Beer is 5% alcohol. The rest, the other 95%, may contain foodstuffs and so on. But alcohol, no. Alcohol is handled by one organ of the human body, the liver. And it handles it at the rate of three quarters of an ounce an hour, about. Now, you can neither accelerate nor decelerate that process. There's no such thing as a hangover cure. The only thing you get when you give black coffee to a drunk is a wide awake drunk. All of these things do nothing. Alcohol is handled by the liver at a steady rate, approximately an ounce an hour. What is it? It's a solvent. Any decent cleaner, for example, has alcohol in it. It has been known to remove stains from desks, desks stomachs, paychecks, bankrolls, careers, marriages, families, and lives. Most alcoholics die because they don't receive proper treatment. This is the best solvent known. It's an irritant. You cut yourself and spill a little alcohol on the cut, you will move quickly. It has been looked upon as a stimulant, but it isn't. And we look upon it as a stimulant because of the nutty things people do when they drink it. And people do wacky things when they drink. Uh, there's a fellow in AA. His standard reply to waiters or waitresses who ask him, would you care for a drink? He always says, no, thank you. I'm allergic to it. And one day a waitress said, what do you mean by that? He said, when I drink, I break out in spots. Houston, Anchorage, New York, San Francisco, and so on. He does nutty things when he drinks. People do that. And for that reason, people have looked on alcohol as a stimulant. Actually, it isn't. It's an antiseptic. A nurse always purify your arm or your leg or wherever else they stick needles into you before they give you the needle. It's an anesthetic. It's a poor anesthetic, but for centuries it was the only one we had. Uh, you hear a lot of garbage from pulpits 
about the moment in which the Roman soldiers offered a sponge full of cheap wine to Christ on the cross. That was meant as an act of simple human kindness to alleviate his pain. Cheap, almost vinegary wine, into which they mixed another drug called myrrh, was standard equipment with those Roman soldiers that had to execute people. They gave them a bang of that and then nailed them and waited for them to die. It helped to keep down the screaming. Basically, in its drinkable form, the chemical C2H5OH is a sedative drug. And alcoholism is addiction to that drug. Now that's this whole talk in one sentence. If there are any alcoholics in the room and you've wondered what's wrong with you, that's what's wrong. An alcoholic is one who is addicted to a sedative drug. Now how do we know that? What is addiction? Everybody uses a word, there are books written about it. I think that addiction is a mystery. Nobody knows what it is. Nobody knows what life is. Nobody knows what God is. You know what we do with mysteries? We look and we describe what we're looking at. That's called a descriptive definition. Thousands of books have been written about electricity. Nobody really knows what it is. We've, uh, they've torn atoms apart and everything. Uh, we know enough about it to make lights, to power nuclear submarines with it. But nobody knows what it is. What's life? We know the difference between a live dog and a dead dog. The principle of life is gone from the dead dog. We know enough about life to prolong it. We know enough about it to alleviate some of its miseries and to cure others. Nobody knows what it is. What do we know about God? Well, a little bit, but it's practically nothing. We see God through what he's done. We look and we describe what we're looking at. But everything we know about God is always in negative terms. We tell what he's not. He is infinite. Which simply means he's not like us. He's not finite and so on. What's addiction? We don't know. What we know about it is what we see. In all addiction, there are two main characteristics. Number one is compulsive use. The addict uses unlike everybody else. He has no control over his usage. He always drinks too much. Always drinks. Now, there are five basic addictions. Narcotics, alcohol, food, gambling, and work. What we're interested in is the drinking. Now, I told him not to drink, and he got drunk. He got drunk. The alcoholic doesn't want to drink as much as he does. I have always used this as a thumbnail definition of the alcoholic. I've always used this on brand new people who are wondering whether they are or not. They, you know, you don't want to be one, but just answer this question honestly. Forget about limitations imposed by husband, wife, child, or parent. Forget all that. Just answer this question honestly. Have you ever in your entire life, ever, drunk more than you determined you were going to drink? I am not talking about, well, I think I'll have a couple tonight and then, uh, you know, it's a class reunion or a surprise birthday party and you drink four instead of three. I'm not talking about that at all. Have you ever seriously determined, I will not drink more than, have you ever gone over that? Just yes or no. If your answer is yes more than once, that indicates compulsion. The alcoholic literally drinks against his will. You did not intend to drink more than three, and you wound up on a four-day binge. That's compulsion. The second characteristic is progression. What that means is this. Unless and until the drinking is stopped completely, it can only get worse. It can only get worse. Once contracted, all compulsion lasts until death. There is no such thing as a cured alcoholic. Now there's a great big thing in AA, the difference between recovered and recovering. I think the whole bloody thing is a waste of words. Recovered means you've gotten well. Doesn't mean you can't get weller. It just means you've gotten over your illness. People who say that they're recovered are not implying that they're cured at all. I compare recovery from alcoholism like recovery from a broken bone. 
I think that while you're in the hospital and while you're wearing a cast, you are recovering, but when they take it off, you're, you're well. Doesn't mean you can't break it again. <laughs> and once you recover from alcoholism, doesn't mean you can't get drunk again. Just means that for now you've gotten well. All right. Once there, it lasts until death. What that means is if you can reactivate it by drinking again. And number two, it gets worse until death. The baffling mystery of alcoholism is that somehow or other it progresses whether you drink or not. Now, I'm not going to try to explain that. We'll just try to comment on it later. Alcoholism is addiction to a sedative drug. Now, we have seen at least a layman's definition of addiction. It's a phenomenon whereby someone uses a substance compulsively, and once he contracts that affliction, it lasts until death and it gets worse. All right? Now let's go back to the first statement, alcohol is a sedative drug. How do we prove that? That's a statement. And Doc Green, in that magnificent simplicity of his, he says, communication can take place in any number of ways. But you learned this when you studied English in first year of high school. The most powerful way to communicate to anybody is through comparison and contrast. You can show someone, for example, the beauty of gratitude by showing the ugliness of ingratitude. Contrast. Or if you, want, if you know something I don't know and you want to communicate it to me, compare it with something that I do know. And that's what Dr. Green does. He shows that alcohol is a sedative drug by comparing its action to the action of another accepted anesthetic sedative drug, ether. All right. Now, we're all familiar with the word ether. We know what it is. It's anesthetic used in hospitals. I, I don't think that there's anybody that doesn't know what ether is. And I think that most of us would accept the fact that uh, we could refer to an anesthetized rabbit as the ether bunny. <laughs> and I promise that that's the last of that. <laughs> anyway, I remember once giving this chalk talk in Annapolis, Maryland to a group of uh, military and civilian personnel from an eastern region. And when this talk was over, a, an old German biochemist came up and explained why ether and alcohol do the same thing. I went through all the comparison that Doc Green had gone through, and then this man came up and just put a formula on the board and showed why they do exactly the same thing. C2H5OH, we'll go back to the chemistry now, is a molecule of ethyl alcohol, the kind we drink. And this little man came back up to the, the blackboard after the talk was over, he said, let me show you why. And he wrote C2H5OH on the board, as I've written it right here just now. And he said, do you know what ether is? I said, no. He said, it is two of them. H, O, C2, H5. So he said, ether is twice as strong as alcohol. But he said, even more than that. In ether, there is no H2O. And he blotted out the middle here, the two H's in the end. The formula for ether, C2H5O, C2H5. So he concluded by saying, ether is twice the strength of alcohol, but it's undiluted. What I say is, ether is a double shot without a chaser, which makes it a little understandable. And it's perfectly true. That's exact. In other words, these two do exactly the same thing, except ether does it quicker. Now let's take a look at it. What does ether do? If you've ever been in a hospital, if you've ever undergone it, I can remember in the eighth grade, I had my tonsils out and they used ether. The very first thing that happens is a kind of dryness in the throat. Ether, you see, is very absorbent of moisture, and it absorbs the moisture from the mucous membranes of the throat. Now, if you've ever undergone surgery, after two or three inhalations, you simply want to pull the mask off and just gulp in fresh air, bring it in. But of course, after a little teeny bit, you begin to feel this 
strange thing that we call euphoria. You feel good. Why? Let's begin at the beginning. What Doc Green said, let's take an adult and give him ether, and then we will take an adult and give him alcohol. We will see that both do the same thing. But before he went into that, the dryness of the throat, the euphoria, so he said, what's an adult? What's a mature person? Everybody in the room has some sort of definition. Uh, Cardinal Newman's classic definition of a gentleman, one who does not consciously cause pain. I think you have to have a certain amount of maturity to fit that definition. Uh, an adult certainly is someone who is sensitive to the sensitivities of other people. What is an adult? All those definitions are perfectly valid and are accurate. Dr. Green's definition was, an adult is someone who functions in life according to the formula I over E. Intellect governs emotions. Now, actually, we don't govern our emotions. But what he's trying to say is what Thomas Aquinas calls us, man is a rational animal, that normally his functioning and his actions are dictated by reason rather than his feelings in the main. All right. He says, now please, let's watch what happens to that formula, I over E, when we introduce a drug to the brain that governs that formula. The human brain, we are all familiar with the fact that the brain is an organ inside the head. It is composed of certain parts, and those parts control functions. The outermost part of the brain is where we have reason, intellect, the seat of judgment. Beneath that, your emotions, your imagination, your memory. As you go deeper into the brain, you find, obviously, it's more protected, and it governs more delicate things. The motor activity of the body, the, the movement of all the inner workings of everything that goes on. Your sense of coordination is where it's visible. <clears throat> the semi-voluntary functions, some of the functions of the human body, we have control over at some time and at other times we don't. The blinking of your eyes. At times you can control it and at times you can't. You just blink instinctively when wind brings dust towards your eyes. There are the purely involuntary functions like the action of your intestines, the action of your stomach, as it handles food, and then you have the innermost, smallest, most protected part of the brain governs those functions that we consider to be essential to life. The Latin word for life is vita, and what is essential to life, obviously, is therefore vital. Anything that is vital has to do with your life. All right. What happens to that brain and the formula, I over E, that is within it, when you drug it? What happens to the brain when you drug it? All right, I know this sounds simplistic. This is not meant to be a science lecture. I don't know that much. All we do know is that usually an anesthetic will hit the whole brain. But step by step, this is what Doc Green is trying to describe if ether were given slowly and put into a human system gradually the dryness in the throat. Now you feel euphoria. He gives an almost mathematical formula for, there's a man going to put a knife to your belly and you feel great. Why do you feel good in a situation that would normally terrify you if you weren't half anesthetized? This is the simplest reason of all. I over E except after D. Add a drug to the brain. The, per the first part that gets hit is the first part that's vulnerable, what controls reason. The watchdog is asleep. The worry wart is gone. You feel good because the drug just put to sleep what would make you feel bad. So it's I over E except after D. Now watch what the drug does to the intellect. Puts it to sleep and liberates the emotions. When there's no control over your feelings, they come out. You have a reversal of the formula, it's now E over I, and you enter an excitement stage. You enter an excitement stage. Um, the important thing to remember is this, when the emotions come out, they come out drugged. You see, that's the next part of the brain that gets hit. 
My friends, you are not watching emotional. But supposing you entered um, an operating room and they were anesthetizing a patient and they stopped it right here. And you looked at someone who was entering an excitement stage and they're babbling and saying goofy things. You're not watching emotional behavior. You're watching drugged emotional behavior. What sense would it make if you were standing beside your mother, let's say she's on an operating table about to be operated on, they stop the anesthetic here and she's saying very crazy things. How many of you would say, good heavens, she needs a psychiatrist? She's on the influence of ether. She doesn't need a psychiatrist at all. But just hold on to that thought for a minute. You may or may not get sick here. I don't know whether you've ever walked by a hospital and, and just gotten a whiff of ether, but it's, it's nauseating, terribly nauseating. Now, if you're in an excitement stage with the danger of nausea, that's just the word. It is dangerous. So they don't keep you here very long. They just kind of slam you through there. After a bit, you hit a stage of pre-anesthesia, you're out. What happens is the brain is being drugged from outside in. Your intellect is gone, the emotions are goofy. The motor activity, your sense coordination is all affected. You could, theori not theoretically, you very well could hurt yourself if they did not shoot you through that. That's why that sheet is wrapped very tightly around you. That's why they're all standing there, and that's why they slam you through this. In fact, what they do today is they give you a needle before you leave your room. You're a little bit gone by the time you get down there. All right. When the semi-voluntary functions are gone, you literally cannot open your eyelid. They call that pre-anesthesia. And it is pre-anesthesia because you can't yet be operated on. It'd be too dangerous. You'd feel the pain. When the brain is sedated down to hear you're, you're anesthetized. When the involuntary functions go, you're in a state of anesthesia. You can now be operated on. Now watch. The only thing you have left is your vital functions, your heartbeat and your breathing. When they go, you do. Death is the next step. Many, many anes well, anesthesiologists are MDs who do nothing but this. It's that important. They can even operate on that brain while they have it out. They can operate on your heart. They can do practically anything. What happens when you come out of it? You go through the same process in reverse, from anesthesia to pre-anesthesia. You'll be sick. You'll undergo an excitement stage, but you will not feel very good. Obviously, you've just had surgery. Ladies and gentlemen, watch this, please. Cross out ether. Substitute alcohol. It does exactly the same thing. I'm not talking about alcoholism. For, for people who are brand new to this program and you feel threatened by it, forget it. I'm not talking about alcoholism, I'm talking about drinking. This is what happens when anyone ingests beverage alcohol. You notice it. You don't notice the dryness. You notice the burning in the throat. You remember your first shot of straight whiskey? It wasn't a taste, it was a sensation. <laughs> the tears are coming down your cheek. Why? It's highly absorbent of moisture. It dries out the mucous membranes of your throat, and then being an irritant, it hurts. Don't you know what happens when you shave your face and then put some uh, aftershave lotion that has alcohol in it on it? Things. That's exactly what happens in your throat. They are very sensitive membranes. That's why we drink chasers after straight shots. Do you ever use the expression here, wet your whistle? That's another dumb expression. Alcohol doesn't wet your whistle, it dries it. The chaser wets your whistle. <laughs> Anyways, what happens when you drink? You feel this burning in the throat and then you feel good. Why is old granddad a little more pleasant than contact? Because it adds this euphoria. You've all heard people make jokes about it called have a hot toddy. I don't know what the hot toddy does except it makes you forget the symptoms of the cold. You've got the cold, but it doesn't bother you much. You feel good, and you enter an excitement stage. All right. What happens? Alcohol is handled at the rate of an ounce an hour. Suppose you drink six ounces in 20 minutes. All right. The liver handles one the first hour. The rest gets in the bloodstream for subsequent trips. When the blood brings it to the brain, the alcohol begins to sedate the brain. How do we know that? Simple observation. 
Doc Green says, don't you know when you're in the presence of people drinking? You don't need to come into a classroom to find that out. If somebody's very drunk, he's going to stagger. If somebody's very drunk, he staggers. But in the beginning, you notice it in the motor activity, that slowness of the blinking of the eyelids, the tongue becomes thick. It's a major production to light a cigarette. The hand weaves a little bit, getting the key into the ignition. And whether you're alcoholic or not, whether you like it or not, Drinkers who drive are a danger to human life. And practically every non-alcoholic who drinks has done that without even thinking. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the physical impossibility to drink and function right. It can't be done. Good Lord, they, they've made movies out in Los Angeles, and there's another one from Canada. They used, up in Canada, they used professional racing drivers. Gave them two shots of whiskey. For those of you who can hold it, and you're big drinkers, they gave professionals two shots of whiskey and put them behind the wheels of their car. They were knocking the pylons down and kind of cursing because they knew this shouldn't be happening. But their reflexes were about a half of a second behind time. The brain was telling them what they ought to do, but the, but the reaction was that much slower. The motor activity was being affected. But anyways, you feel good because alcohol puts to sleep what would make you feel bad when alcohol gets to the brain begins to put it to sleep. So it's I over E, except after A, add drug alcohol, put the intellect to sleep, release the emotions, and what you see is drugged emotional behavior. And here's where everybody makes a mistake in the treatment of the alcoholic. <coughs> we would not dream of sending our mother under the influence of ether to a psychiatrist but we send loved ones or patients under the influence of alcohol to a psychiatrist. This doesn't make sense. What am I trying to say? Answer this question. It's an easy one. How would you know if your mother needs care for her emotional problems? Wouldn't you say the obvious? We'll get the ether out of her so we see what she really is, and then if she needs help, she needs help. Same way with the, with the alcoholic. Some alcoholics need deeper therapy after they get sober, but there's the clue, after they get sober. Doc Green, in 6,000 patients, he said, I have found that some alcoholics after they get sober do need care. The percentage of alcoholics who need professional help after they recover is exactly the same as the percentage of non-alcoholics. Ladies and gentlemen, alcoholism is a biochemical addiction to a drug. Now, if you were nuts before you started to use it, you'll be a little wackier after you quit. <laughs> but the drinking. But here, and you will, of course, need help. But many, even professionals, look at the results of the drinking and conclude that they're the causes. Well, of course he's drinking. He's an alcoholic. He's a maniac. Uh-uh. He's a maniac because he's drinking. <laughs> a little child knows that all of these things are the result of the drinking, not the cause, and you wipe out the drinking, you wipe, why is he working again? He doesn't drink. Why is he invited back into people's houses? He doesn't drink. You've removed the cause of all these. A little kid knows that. Ladies and gentlemen, I did this in my home not too long ago. Uh, a youngster whose mother has a drinking problem came to see me. Little fellow, he started to cry. He said, I don't want to leave my mother. And he just ran over and sat in my lap. And when his tears dried, he sat back down again. I asked him one simple question. I said, what's wrong in your house? Five words. Five words. My mother drinks too much. And people have spent months and even years in therapy to find out what the problem is. Ladies and gentlemen, that little kid knew that alcohol was the problem. Get rid of the alcohol, then we'll go after the other stuff. Then we'll go after the other stuff that needs going after. Anyway, what kind of a drinker are you? When your inhibitions, the I, is put to sleep, what kind of drugged emotional behavior comes out? There are basic types of drinkers and drunks with hundreds of different variations on the theme. There's the jocose type, the life of the party. He's very shy, but three or four drinks later, he's telling the stories and leading the fun. There's the bellicose type, that's from the Latin word for war. The fighting drunk is what he is. I know another fellow in AA, he goes into a restaurant, the waitress says, would you care for a drink? And his standard reply is always, lady, if I took a drink, you wouldn't like me very much. He used to tear places to shreds. He was a bellicose fighting drunk. 
usually fighting drunks are little guys who are afraid of the dark but get them drunk and they'll take on King Kong. And I would say in AA you can spot them, the new men with the new teeth. <laughs> but there is another conclusion to come, tr come to. If you know a big drunk who is nasty, leave him alone. <laughs> now I mean that. I've heard people say, oh I can handle him, I'm the only one who can. Well, yeah. Well one day he may handle you. He's drugged. Don't play around with big, nasty drunks. And then there's the lacrimose or crying drunk. Have you ever met one? Have you ever been one? Usually the big, well, uh, we won't even go into that. That takes forever. Somebody once said that the alcoholic is alone in a crowd. Well, he didn't even come close. And I believe that all the garbage in the soul of an alcoholic wants out. No one likes being dirty. And I think that very often our fears, especially our fears of God, disappear or want to disappear. Uh, when the alcoholic gets drunk, his fears of God disappear and he looks up people connected with God. That's why a lot of priests and ministers and so on get calls from drunks. Please help me, please help me, please help me. And, of course, the alcoholic would not do that when he's sober, but he does when he kills his inhibitions and his fears and so on. But anyway, the crying drunk, uh, that's room for a whole book in itself. Anyways, if you drink enough, you'll pass out. Now, please, watch the paradoxes of alcohol. It is an anesthetic, and it was used as such. In the Middle Ages, if they wanted to amputate your leg, they got you drunk till you passed out and then cut it off quick because still you could feel it. Why is alcohol a poor anesthetic? It's a liquid. It's a liquid. Once you drink enough to become unconscious, pre-anesthesia, you can't pick up a glass and swallow any more to get down into anesthesia. If you do, you're liable to take too much and go on down and die. It's very, very hard. Theoretically, you could drink enough up here to slam you down into anesthesia, but who's going to say you're going to stop there? I remember once I was up at Rutgers Summer School of Alcohol Studies. They were trying to show all this, the influence of alcohol on the body and they used laboratory rats. I think there were three or four rats. Uh, he, he took maybe a third of an ounce of alcohol and injected it into the rat. And they put him on a tightrope where you could see the rat walk across the tightrope. He put this tiny amount of alcohol to show, you know, the influence on the motor activity for people who think they drive well when they drink. And the old rat was staggering across there and falling and grabbing onto the rope and so on. Then he put a little more in. The rat couldn't get up to the rope. And then he put enough in, the rat passed out. And I went up to him afterwards, and it was a brilliant lecture, a very, a very humorous lecture and a very informative lecture. And I went up afterwards and I said, uh, will that rat come too? And he says, I don't know, we lose about half of them. He was anesthetized to a point where his vital functions were put to sleep. He said, this one might or might not. And it was a very frightening thing, very frightening thing. Anyways. Coming out of it, you go through the same process in reverse. Now, please, let's just look at two people who go through this process. One's an alcoholic and one isn't. And then we'll go into alcoholism and see what it is. Right now, we're just talking about alcohol, the substance alcohol. We, well, a few comments about alcoholism, but we'll go into it now. Uh, Charlie and his aunt go to a New Year's Eve party. Charlie's the alcoholic. He drinks compulsively. His aunt doesn't drink at all because he does. Just very briefly, watch what happens to Charlie. Listen to this, please. It's important. He comes to see the New Year in. All right? That's at midnight. He shows up at 5 p.m. He gets there early and has the first drink. He burns his throat, feels good. For a while, he's the loving life of the party. Somebody bangs him in the mouth. He cries in his beer and passes out. <laughs> at 20 minutes of midnight, Charlie hadn't seen a New Year in in six years. Charlie has not seen a New Year in in six years. Not by intention. He came to see the New Year in and he's unconscious. Why? Charlie drinks compulsively. He couldn't help it. He wanted euphoria and shot through it. How many alcoholics in this, how many of you have ever set out to have a good time drinking and come to perhaps in a hospital a week and a half later? 
How many of you have set out to have a good time drinking and spent the next three days with a horrible hangover unable to eat? That's what happens to the Charlies of the world. Normal drinkers, ladies and gentlemen, drink for euphoria. They get it and they stop there. And it is the gift of God that gladdens the hearts of men. The alcoholic cannot stop there. He shoots through it. And Mabel doesn't drink at all. But watch the influence of alcohol on a non-drinker. They give her a screwdriver and tell her it's orange juice. And halfway through, her head's down on the table. She doesn't even know she's had a drink. She's unconscious. The next morning, Charlie will wake up with a hangover. He'll take three or four shots before he gets out of bed so he won't commit suicide when he shaves. And old Mabel just wakes up. Oh, perhaps her head hurts a little bit, but she doesn't even know she's had a drink. What's the difference between Charlie and Mabel? What is an alcoholic? For those of you in the room who are wondering, all right, maybe you're here against your will. Maybe you've heard people talk to you about your drinking and gotten angry about it. Well, that's a pretty good indication you've got a problem because a non-alcoholic's not threatened by somebody talking about his drinking. I think the basic definition of alcoholic is somebody who's drinking makes trouble. I remember some years ago down in Jessup's Cut, I gave this talk and uh, to the inmate, to some of the inmates who were in AA, and there was a young man there, 28 years old, with one arm. His left arm was missing. You know what? <laughs> you know what convinced him he was an alcoholic? His cellmate was in AA, and he came to meetings just to get out of his cell. He went with his roommate, and while he was there, he heard. When your drinking causes problems, that is a drinking problem. That man got drunk three times in his life, just three times. The first time, he was a very young man. He had an accident with a, uh, one of these farm machines and lost his arm. The second time he got drunk was a real beauty. And the result of that was, after a prolonged period of time, he lost his family. And the third time he got drunk, he committed a crime of violence that robbed him of his freedom, is in jail. And he concluded rather correctly that even though he had only gotten drunk three times in his life, he was an alcoholic. He didn't drink normally. I believe this, ladies and gentlemen, if your drinking has ever become the topic of serious concerned conversation on the part of other people, that's a drinking problem. That's a drinking problem. Just answer this one really easy. Have you ever lied about your drinking? Just yes or no. Have you ever lied about it? Normal drinkers don't do that. And the key to it is this. Just answer this question. Do normal drinkers do this? Whatever it is. Do normal drinkers do this? If your answer is no, you've got abnormalcy. Now please, let's look at some of the symptoms of alcoholism. And this is not normal. Just see if you fit in here anywhere. The prime basis for alcoholism, all alcoholics drink too much. <laughs> Wasn't that a brilliant statement? All alcoholics drink too much. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of non-alcoholics drink too much. What's the difference between addictive drinking and alcohol abuse? Addiction or alcoholism means drinking against your will. The abuser is free. He chooses to drink that way. Many people become alcoholics by deliberately drinking too much in the days when they did have control. I think it is flirting with death on the part of youngsters who just without thought choose to get drunk. They are pumping a dangerous addictive substance into their systems without even blinking. Without even blinking. It's the same way with drugs. Whether they're harmful or not, or not, <laughs> is almost beyond the point. They are dangerous. I don't think anyone questions that. <laughs> it's like a kid saying, well, it's fun to juggle these dynamite sticks. I haven't died yet, you know. So, well, anyway, we won't even go into that now. What is excessive drinking? What is excessive drinking? Because every alcoholic says, I don't drink that much. What do you mean excessive? I don't drink a whole lot. In other words, what is a whole lot for one person may not be for another. But there still is a standard answer as to what is excessive. The amount that causes trouble. 
I don't think anybody should have too much trouble grasping that. If it makes trouble, that's too much. However much makes problems is too much. What are some of the problems that can happen drinking? Number one, blackout. Blackout. That's a present lapse of memory. You can remember graduating from grammar school and you can't remember driving the car home last night. A normal drinker who would have a blackout would be so terrified of it, it would never happen again. My God, alcoholics blackout all the time doesn't even phase them. Doesn't phase them. Many an alcoholic gets up in the morning, looks out his window to see if the car is still there. Or to see if it's there at all. He doesn't remember driving home last night. Many an alcoholic will see a damaged fender and drive that night. A non-alcoholic would say, my God, that dent may have been put there by a child that I hit. Doesn't phase the alcoholic. Really doesn't phase him. Gulping and sneaking drinks. Do normal drinkers do that? It's called the closet drinker. You've heard that expression. Do you know a normal eater who goes into a closet to eat a sandwich? You see, normal people don't do these things that the alcoholic does. Gulping and sneaking drinks is a kind of an unnatural way to drink. Do normal drinkers do that? Of course not. A normal drinker wants to take a drink, he takes a drink. Loss of control. That's what we're talking about there. It's a result of compulsion. Have you ever drunk more than you determined you were going to drink? Loss of control. Now, how do you explain that? Supposing you did, but oh, jeez, if you were married to this one, you'd drink too. If you had the job I had, you'd drink too. There's always a reason why we drink too much. Alibi says, why'd you drink last? Why'd you get drunk last Thursday? It rained. Well, why'd you get drunk Friday? He says, it didn't rain. <laughs> well, why'd you get drunk today? The Vikings lost. Why'd you get drunk last week? They won. You, <laughs> you know what an alibi is? an unreasonable reason for doing something. It's yesterday and it's no tomorrow. <laughs> Normal drinkers don't need alibis to drink. The eye-opener, the need of a drink after a period of deprivation. It's usually in the morning, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, people that... Uh, <laughs> suppose you know somebody that happens to like orange soda, and he drinks two of them one evening at, you know, in the summer, you have a cookout and he drinks a couple of oranges. Do you know anybody that wakes up at 4.30 in the morning shaking to pieces and he doesn't stop shaking until he gets another bottle of orange? I've never met one. I've never met one. I know a whole lot of drinkers who need an eye-opener to function. In, in uh, corporate management, many a top executive has to have a half pint on board before he can sign business letters or put his name to a check. Drinking alone. No alcoholic wants anyone else to know he drinks as much as he does as often as he does, so he tries to drink where you can't see him. And when you're catching him doing it, it's, it's very embarrassing. How many of you men in the room would... What would you feel like if you went home and saw your wife sneak out of the dining room, into the bathroom, open the toilet tank, pull out a bottle of milk and drink three shots? <laughs> you have her put away in about five minutes with no questions asked. And you drink booze that way. Now, isn't that funny? You know, <laughs> and we can't see woods for trees. Change the pot. I got to do something about my drinking, so we switch from bourbon to vodka. For this beauty, well, let's try. Be I heard a man uh, last night say that he never drank anything but beer, but he got just as drunk. You know the difference between a beer drinker and a whiskey drinker? The amount of alcohol you find in a 12 ounce bottle of beer is exactly how much alcohol you'll find in a shot of whiskey. Conclusion is obvious. <laughs> if you're a beer drinker, you've got to drink more beer to get it. And you have to go to the bathroom more often, and it ain't worth it. We're going to have a cold winter. <laughs> and and uh, getting up three or four times in the middle of the night, it isn't worth it. They tell that one beer drinker, went into a bar, and he had as much as he could hold, and finally he ordered another one, went in the men's room, poured it in the jug. Somebody asked him what, what was wrong with him, and he lost his mind. He said, no, he just tired of being the middle man. He just thought it, it just goes straight on down Antisocial behavior. It's perfectly normal to have fun at parties. At New Year's Eve parties, don't people put on goofy hats and blow noisemakers and yell and sing and do crazy things? It's the way we act at football games. 
you know, you're going to yell and scream at a football game like you wouldn't act out on 33rd Street. Get in that stadium and become a maniac. Uh, so it's perfectly normal to have fun at parties and to do the conga and stand on the piano and sing songs. But on a Saturday afternoon, you know, walk into a neighbor's house and jump up on his piano with your golf shoes on and practice. That's a little bit gross. So that you don't vomit on people's rugs for fun. Drunks do that. Alcoholics do that. And this antisocial behavior has results. It results in loss, a lot of losses families, friends, and jobs. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to go into them. I just want you to hear this one line. You can lose friends if you don't shower. You can lose jobs if you don't show up or you work poorly. Families bust up for thousands of reasons. What I'm trying to say tonight is this. If alcohol causes this, that's an alcohol problem. I call it alcoholism. I call it alcoholism. Uh, there's a young fellow we just hired to work for us. Lost his family because of drinking. There are neighbors in every neighborhood have lost their families because of drinking. One who discovered his headless body, he blew it off with a shotgun. These things don't happen to normal drinkers. Doctors and hospitals. <laughs> Do you know anybody in your neighborhood? This guy sits down, he has a pizza and a glass of beer one night and winds up in the hospital for the next three weeks. This doesn't happen to normal drinkers. It happens to alcoholics. Alcoholics, after a while, as it progresses, wind up in the hospital. And then you hear this, well, it was only once. And a guy goes to a hospital 18 times. He says, well, I know a guy went 21 times. Always someone worse than me. I don't want to look at my drinking. I'm going to look at somebody who drinks worse than I do, drinks more than I do. Has anyone ever asked you about your drinking and you pointed your finger to somebody who drank more than you? Everybody does that. Doctors and hospitals. But finally comes, you know, the doctor just sits you down and says, Hey, Harry, you happen to have cirrhosis of the liver, and this damage is irreparable. Keep drinking and the liver keeps getting worse. That's the story. And so some alcoholics are forced into sobriety through fear. It's usually very ineffective, very ineffective. I knew a man, a very lovely man too, was sober 11 years. He picked up a drink and became a vegetable. I knew another man had 22 years of sobriety because of circumstances, whatever. He picked up a drink and one year later he was buried it does progress whether you drink or not. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know what happens to an alcoholic who picks up a drink after a period of time, a period of sober time? He does not pick up where he left off. He does not pick up where he left off. He picks up where he would have been if he had been drinking all that time. Doesn't this make sense to you? Please, doesn't this make sense? Supposing alcoholics could stay sober for five years and then begin at the beginning again. Everybody would be doing it. But every alcoholic who has ever tried to drink again has wound up either dead or dying. Alcoholics cannot drink. The alcohol will ultimately kill them. The only answer is permanent, perpetual, you know, abstinence. When an alcoholic picks up a drink after a prolonged stretch of sobriety, and we see these tragedies all the time, and they usually come in batches, somebody with 22 years sobriety, 20 years sobriety, 18 years sobriety, they, they come sometimes just in batches like that. It's very frightening. Very, very frightening. And a lot of them, their shame will not allow them to come back and get well again. It is frightening. Uh, the so-called theory about trying to help alcoholics or teach alcoholics to drink again is going to kill a lot of people. Thunders and binges. You know what happens in a person who stays sober out of fear and doesn't have the ongoing therapy of AA? I'm a man. I've been sober 11 years. I can handle a beer. And he does. He does. But there's a poem that the uh, Orientals have. At the punch bowl's brink, let the thirsty think what they say in Japan. First the man takes a drink, then the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes the man. He drinks a beer and handles it. And the next day he drinks a beer and handles it. But the very nature of his disease is compulsive drinking. The next day you see he handles three beers. 
And this goes on for about four days, and then he handles three shots. And two weeks later, three-fifths handles him. And he doesn't know what hit him. And people begin to go on benders and binges that they've never done before. And they don't know what's happening. The progression of the disease. There is even some, and this is almost inexplicable, but I've talked to a couple of AA doctors about this. Sometimes physical damage is inaugurated in the early years of drinking, and it progresses as years go by. Some people, after a prolonged stretch of sobriety, begin to feel and see deterioration that is simply the result of the early years of abuse of drinking. Anyways, tremors. Doc Green used to call that an infallible sign of addiction. I don't mean necessarily the external shakes. I mean that combined with that internal quivering for a drink. And the alcoholic will call, crawl through snow to get it. He'll steal from his children to get it. And these are not the antics of normal people. But that is at the heart of the matter. The alcoholic is not normal. He drinks compulsively. Protect the supply. Answer this question as honestly as you can, quickly, with a yes or no. Did you ever hide a bottle? Just yes or no. Normal people don't do that. Alcoholics do. Pay the bartender. Keep that line of supply open. Prominent, prominent lawyer in an eastern city. His wife came up to me one day and she said, we live in a beautiful home in a marvelous section of the city and my husband makes a ton of money. And she said, I was never so embarrassed in my life when the dentist kept calling to have a $12 bill paid. My husband couldn't need it. But keep that bartender paid and keep that liquor store paid. Keep that line of supply open. Protect the supply. Hide the bottle, ladies and gentlemen, is way down the end of the line here. So if you have ever hidden bottles, what you are saying is this. Don't talk to me about my drinking. I'm going to lie about it. I'm going to protect this supply. This is essential. Do you know why alcoholics lie? Do you know why they live the lie? If I'm a practicing alcoholic and I tell you the truth about my drinking, you're going to tell me to quit. And I know I can't. I don't want to admit that, but I know I cannot live without alcohol. Who can live without alcohol? Many alcoholics honestly believe that alcohol is an essential part of life. Unreasonable resentment. Here's where the family is going crazy. I have heard women say, I'm damned if I do and I'm damned if I don't. If I say yes, I'm wrong. If I say no, I'm wrong. You see, the alcoholic is running out of alibis and he needs reasons to drink. And so if you say good morning, he resents that because he wanted you not to say good morning so he can resent that. <laughs> They're built that way. If she has dinner waiting for him, he laughs at her for being a fool. And if she doesn't have dinner waiting for him, he hits her. The effects of alcoholism on the family as a result of unreasonable resentments, absolutely unbelievable. I like to go into it sometime when I'm in speaking about the family, but I know a young lady out west who is working with family. All children are deeply affected by the drinking of a parent, no matter how young. I saw a presentation that this lady gave, and she showed crayon drawings from children of all ages, beginning with age four. I almost didn't believe what I was looking at. Now this absolutely frightening aspect of family and the result of the resenting, insane really, irrational alcoholic. The children who cope, those who make it, the 15 year old boy who replaces both mother and father, he gets his little brothers and sisters out of bed, he feeds them, he clothes them, he gets them off to school, he himself is an A student. He's also damaged by the drinking of the parents. They have found that when people like that grow up, they are so emotionally isolated, it is practically impossible for them to have a normal relationship with another human being. And many of them, oddly enough, go into caregiving professions. 
There is the goodness in them that wants out, and somehow they want to make up for the tragedy in their own home, and many of them go into medicine, nursing, and education. It is astounding how many professional people come from alcoholic parents. Astounding. But anyway, that's for another day. Nameless fears and anxieties. I have said this, and I'll say it till I die. Alcoholism teaches its victims one single, simple, solitary thing, and that's how to be scared to death. The only thing the alcoholic learns is fear. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, you can almost smell it. And the loneliness I will never in my life forget, leaving a hospital through the emergency room one day, and I saw a derelict sitting on a cot with a policeman who brought him in, standing outside the little cubicle with his back toward the man. Everyone else was receiving attention in there. He had dried blood on his scalp. Evidently, he had fallen and split his scalp. Everyone else was receiving attention except him, and he's sitting in there on his hands, kind of shaking. He is filthy dirty. He had on a coat that must have been 600 years old, and you could smell that man's loneliness. It was, uh, God, the picture haunts me now. It's me. Anyways, fears and anxieties. As I said earlier this evening, whoever said that an alcoholic is alone in a crowd didn't even come close. So you finally come to the end of the line, if the alcoholic is lucky enough, and he reaches a collapse in his alibi system. Usually, in most cases, death occurs before the collapse of the alibi system. If an alcoholic is lucky enough, he reaches a point in his life, it's called the moment of truth, in which he looks into the mirror of himself and actually sees what is there. He says, I did not intend to drink last night, but I got drunk. It was not because the Colts won or because they lost, they didn't play. I don't know whether it rained or it didn't. I don't know what the weather was. It isn't the people I work with, I'm unemployable. It isn't her big mouth, she's gone. It isn't any of these things. I didn't intend to drink and I got drunk. I have a drinking problem. Now when an alcoholic reaches that stage in his life, he can get help. I believe that we can bring him to this moment of decision. I believe that proper confrontation can force an alcoholic into treatment. There is a, uh, an alcoholic doctor friend of mine out in the Midwest who says that his life was saved by the dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Michigan. He pulled him in one, one afternoon. He said, Mr. Smith, yes, sir. He said, get sober or you will not become a doctor. Yes, sir. And he got sober. He wanted to be a doctor more than he wanted to be drunk. So he had to do the job. Can you force people into treatment? You can, if you have the power and the authority enough to do it. Can you force them to get well? No. You can force them into treatment hoping that they'll respond. The response has to come from the alcoholic. I say give him something to respond to. Get the alcoholic into treatment. You see, if the alcoholic surrenders to his addiction, he winds up incarcerated, insane, or dead. But if he surrenders to proper help, he can get well. To what degree? In treatment centers where treatment is proper, somewhere between 60 to 80 percent of alcoholics get well. They simply recover. I think that's a better rate than the uh, uh, recovery rate from cancer. They simply get well. If you show a man he's sick instead of evil, and if you show him that his sickness is treatable and he can get well, ladies and gentlemen, most sick people want to be well. Most sick people want to be well, but you've got to show any sick first. And I believe that's the, that is the aim and the purpose of proper treatment. And so, the treatment for alcoholism is AA, aided and abetted by anything else that helps, psychiatry, psychology, medicine, group, name it. What might work might work, but what might work best is AA. I believe that God Almighty allowed us to discover the science of medicine for sick bodies, psychiatry for sick minds, psychology for sick emotions, 
and Q trial and error AA is the proper therapy for alcoholism. You know what it is? It's a 12 step ladder up out of the pit. Step one, I can't handle it. That's for starters. When an alcoholic admits that he's helpless, that he absolutely needs help from other people, he now ceases to be hopeless. There's now hope. I cannot handle this. I need help. Step two, I can't handle it. Step two, God can. Working through the agency of people. Step three, I believe I'll get in touch. I can't handle it. God can. I think I'll get in touch. And the rest of the steps keep the alcoholic sober. These three get him sober and the rest keep him that way. Quite simply, it works. Ladies and gentlemen, Doc Green, in my opinion, was a genius. He had a grasp of the obvious. I've seen this segment here, the comparison of ether with alcohol, save lives. I remember one man listening to his lecture when it was all, he was giving this one talk, the comparison of ether and alcohol. When it was over, he said, any questions? And this man just sat there shaking his head. He put his hand up. He said, Doc, for 20 years I have wondered what's wrong with me, and you explained it in 20 minutes. Now what do I do? Man had it made. All I had to do was get with and he did. He was sober about 18 years and died a sober death. It works. It simply works. For those of you who are kind of on the fence, you don't know whether you are or aren't, I'm just asking you to open your minds. Just open your minds. If you heard anything of yourself here, you belong. And I always tell, tell people, no one goes into treatment by mistake. How many of you gained entrance into AA for good behavior? I, you know, the, the obvious becomes so obvious when somebody kicks us in the teeth with it. And this was Doc Green's genius. He had a grasp of the obvious. He could say the sky is blue and everybody else would look up. Oh, it is blue. Doc knew that all along. He knew that all along. And the only thing he does here is spell out the ABCs of alcoholism. If you fit, if you fit, I would suggest that you try to get well because if you don't, your drinking will do things to you. But whether or not any of you here are alcoholics or are not alcoholics, if you have a problem with your drinking, I hope to God I just spoiled your drinking for you. Thank you for being here and thank you for listening to me.